On this week's episode of Hockey Inside Out, the Montreal Canadiens season has popped like my zit, and that's it, that's all. They're finished. We recap the loss of the Philadelphia Flyers and the reaction to the debut of Sean Farrell and the return of Caden Primo. As for the Montreal Canadiens' size right now, is that a concern moving towards the future of this organization? And finally, what should have fans look forward to towards the offseason into the new year? Plus the bonus questions on this week's episode of Hockey Inside Out. Welcome in to a new edition of Hockey Inside Out. I'm your host, Mo Khan, alongside Stu Cameron, Andrew Berkshire, and Rick Green. Gentlemen, it is all over for the Montreal Canadiens. It took till Game 75 for them to be officially eliminated from the playoffs, unlike last year. But they become the sixth team to be out of the playoff race. But the return of Katie Primo being one of the focal points of the storyline in the loss to Philadelphia, and also the debut of Sean Farrell, who played just over 13 minutes against the Flyers on the road. Your reaction to Sean Farrell's debut with the Montreal Canadiens, guys? Well, it was good. I mean, imagine the kid, a big jump going from Harvard straight to uh, the playing in the NHL. They, you know, he joined the team in Buffalo. They didn't play him against the Sabres. Get, get him, get him, get his feet wet, be around the team, have a bit of a skate, meet some of the guys and the equipment staff and whatnot. Um, sort of an uneventful first game. He didn't get a shot on goal, but the key at this point for Sean Farrell is just to get him some experience in the NHL and let him play some games and get used to his teammates and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, playing, can't imagine just how excited he must have been. You know, they gave him that rookie skate coming out alone uh, during the pregame warm-up. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned, the night the Canadians are officially eliminated from the playoffs. It was interesting to see them call up Caden Primo uh, to play the game. Um, 23 years old. The thing moving forward with him, his next season, uh, he has a clear waivers to be sent back to Laval. So they got to find out what they're going to do with this guy moving forward. Are they going to keep him here? Are they going to play him in the NHL? Are they going to trade him in the offseason? So I think it was a case of both Kent Hughes and, and Jeff Gorton wanting to get a look at him in the NHL and also maybe giving other teams a look at him in the NHL in case they are going to trade him in the offseason and go in a different direction with their goaltending. But that's one of the things you know, we've spoken about on previous shows here. One of the things interesting moving forward with this team is how they're going to handle that goaltending situation. Are they going to maybe trade Jake Allen over the summer and bring up Caden Primo and have him and Montembeau be the tandem moving forward? Or are they going to move on from Caden Primo and realize he's not the goalie of the future um, rather than risk losing him for nothing on waivers, try and get something for him. So it's an interesting scenario to follow. And it'll also be interesting to see if Primo gets some more games moving forward. But um, for Farrell, I, I imagine he'll play the rest of the games uh, this season. It's almost like a, uh, I don't want to say a tryout, but it's an early training camp for him uh, to show the Canadians what he can do at the NHL level after a very successful two seasons at Harvard. Yeah, and let's face it, John Farrell, uh, you know, a young kid coming in, all excited to be uh, given the opportunity. And before you pass a lot of judgment on, uh, after after one game, I think we need, like a lot of the young guys, see what he does with more and more uh, exposure to the NHL level. I mean, uh, you know, from what I could see, he's, he's a kid that's uh, pretty smart, pretty quick, and, you know, has uh, obviously has some talent. So, you know, let's give him an opportunity or a fair look at to see uh, how he handles himself, uh, you know, more than just uh, judging by by the one game. And Caden Primo, I think we touched on it before. I think we were all in, uh, you know, concern that uh, this guy, is he the real deal, 23 years old? You know, he's playing okay, 500 record in, in Laval. Is he, is he able to play at the NHL level? And again, um, Giving him one game, he, I thought he had himself pretty well, uh, but I'm not sure over the long term whether he's a, the type of uh, goalie that uh, is going to be able to do it at the NHL level. And of course, those guys uh, develop at different stages in their career, but uh, I think that, um, you know, moving the clock forward a little bit, uh, they're going to have to make a decision on him sooner than later. And, um, That'll help in uh, you know deciding what they want to do with the tandem of Al Allen and Montembeau. But right now, I think they're pretty well uh, set with those two guys, unless something very attractive comes along in the off season for Allen. But they better get something back because I don't believe, uh, seeing what I've seen so far, that Caden Primo is is a guy that's going to be able to step in and and you know uh, play long term. Yeah, I, I agree that I, I'm not sold on Primo as of yet, but I, I was impressed with how he played in that game. I think a lot was riding on it for him. You could tell the first couple shifts he was a little bit jittery and nervous, but uh, when the first real shot that you face is a pretty darn good breakaway, you know, good to stop that. And after that, I thought he settled down quite a bit. He was tracking the puck pretty well. 
it, it was a big difference between Caden Primo this this year and last year in the NHL, right? Like last year in the NHL, it was like full on deer in the headlights, could not find his net. It was a big issue every game out there. So it was good to see him get that in there. But is he still a goaltender of the future for the Montreal Canadiens? I don't know. At, at this at this point, I feel like he's got to establish himself to the point where he's locking horns with Sam Montembeau for the next couple of years and pushing for for more starts, more than just making the NHL. He's got to take a big step to actually justify continuing to keep him on the NHL roster, especially if you're going to move on from Jake Allen in order to, to do it just because of what Jake Allen brings in that dressing room. So, so there's that. Uh, as for Sean Farrell, a decent amount of ice time, I thought, but I'd like to see him with some different line mates. Uh, I know Joe Druin has been playing really well lately, and I know that uh, Gurionov is shooting the lights out, but both guys not the best defensively, and when you're putting a rookie with that as well, playing his first game, it didn't work out so well uh, in their own zone, and Farrell didn't get much of a chance to shine in the offensive zone. So I think a little bit more support, from teammates that are a little bit more rounded could help him out through the rest of the season, but decent debut. He had that one really nice back check. He created one nice scoring chance, but uh, nothing to throw a party over at this stage. It's interesting, Andrew, you mentioned about Primo losing his net. He lost his net for one of those goals against the Flyers also. That seems to be a recurring problem for him. And, you know, he had sort of been given that tag goalie of the future, but you got to remember he was a seventh round draft pick. His reasons why he was a seventh round pick in the seventh round, you're trying to find a needle in the haystack. Uh, after the Canes drafted him, he played really well at university. He was named the top goalie in NCAA. So that sort of raised his stock there. But again, he was a seventh round pick and that losing his net is an issue. And he'll go to the Farrell. I'm wondering, Rick, what do you remember about your first game in the NHL? <laughs> uh, quite nervous. Um, you know, obviously uh, kind of uh, wide eyed and looking around saying, oh, wow. Uh, I'm actually playing in the NHL and look at some of these guys that I used to see on TV. So it's, it's a little intimidating to say the least. And, you know, in all fairness, uh, uh, everybody adjusts uh, with different time frames, and uh, you know, it's, um, it's, it's just give them experience and let them grab a hold of it and, and run with it. And uh, that's the best uh, way to, you know, get a read on, on kids is how they handle themselves with time. Maybe it's just because I'm getting older, but these kids look younger and younger. He skated on the ice last night. He looked like a 14-year-old <laughs> kid going out there or something like that. But the, but again, it's a, for, right now, there's these last uh, handful of games, it's just a case of him getting his feet wet. I'm sure Marty St. Louis, you know, when Jordan Harris first got called up uh, last season, he told them, you're going to make four or five mistakes a game. Don't worry about it. Just go out and play your game. And I'm sure that's the same thing he's told Trent Farrell. Just go out and play your game. Don't worry about it. Uh, enjoy the experience. Uh, we'll correct what mistakes we see. Uh, you're making and work with you. But uh, that's a big, I think one of the reasons the Canadians had so many problems developing young players in the past is they just made them so nervous when they did get on the ice. They were so afraid to make a mistake and you're already so nervous as it is and add in the pressure that if you make one mistake, you probably won't play again and you'll sit on the bench. It just makes it more difficult. That's one of the things that I think this Marty St. Louis coaching staff have been really good at with these young guys is just letting them play their games. They realize it's all about development and the best way to develop guys is to take that pressure off that, there's you know when you're so afraid to make a mistake you usually make more mistakes yeah and the best example of that Stu, is do you remember Eunice Natanen who played for the Canadians way back he played one shift he lost a face off and I forget which team it was against but the Canadians allowed a goal and Michelle Terrian stapled him to the bench the rest of the time he played one shift in the NHL and that's it that's the only chance he ever got well Victor Mete spoke about that when he uh went to Ottawa said it was hard to play when you had the coaches breathing down your neck every time you had a mistake you went back to the bench and they were screaming and yelling at you and uh, it, was, it was a hard way to play and they've changed I mean Luke Richardson wasn't like that when he was dealing with the defense and Stefan Robida the reason he was brought here making the jump right from midget coaching was all about development he had that experience working with the Maple Leafs and the players talk about it it's just that it's even Jeff Petrie a veteran guy uh, I remember him telling me how much he appreciated Luke Richardson. You know, he said, I know when I make a mistake on the ice, the worst thing is you get back to the bench and then you got the coach yelling at you. You already know you screwed up. It's sort of a lot more effective. Maybe get a pat on the back and say, don't worry about it. Uh, get it out of your mind and move forward. And that was one of the problems with Jeff Petrie early in his career. He couldn't get over mistakes he would make. It would get in his head and they would multiply and multiply. So now you got all these young defensemen and these young forwards also being given the chance to, to play their game. You know, he's an offensive player, Farrell. Go out there, play your offensive style of game, try and get some points, and don't worry too much about the mistakes you're going to make. Yeah, and I, I think it's a real bonus, obviously, to have the, uh, you know, the coaching staff on board with saying, you know what, uh, 
mistakes are going to happen. Uh, don't worry about it. Learn from it, and you know, get ready for the next shift. Because I know many times as an assistant, I got the, uh, uh, the the big eyeballs from the head coach and looking down, saying, "You know what? Uh, I read his his look in his face. Don't put that guy back on the ice again." And you know, the player is the first one to realize that uh, it's coming. That he's going to get uh, you know going to get sad, and it's not a comfortable way to develop, especially as as you're a young guy that. Uh, is trying to figure out, uh, you know, how to survive in the NHL, uh, let alone play. So it's uh, it's a bonus, and it seems to be consistent with everybody down the lineup, and uh, it's a, it's it's working, and it's going to continue to work as they get more and more young guys stepping in and given opportunities that they wouldn't have had many years ago. And especially the stage the Canadians are at now in the first full season of a rebuild. I mean, a couple of years down the road, they might be a little bit less tolerant for mistakes by guys who have been around for two or three years, but at this point. You're trying to build this young team together, a bunch of guys around the same age, and um, they're having fun playing together. They really are, and uh, the coaching staff's a big reason for that. Gentlemen, this you know we mentioned Caden Primo. We know Farrell's going to play probably the rest of the season of seven games left. How many games does does Primo get as a goaltender with seven games to go? And what does he have to do to convince you guys and management that he could be a player that could be in this rotation after the season? Well, I, I, for, sorry, for me, I was just saying, you know, in all fairness to the kid, I, I mean, here's a guy that has the toughest position on the team, and you throw him into a situation where it's like, and again, it's a test of character and uh, is the ability to be able to handle himself, but it's a real tough uh, scenario for a kid to come in and say, okay, make things happen. you got one game, uh, do it. And, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily happen. Some guys luck out and have success in their first game. Pucks are hitting them that's not supposed to hit them. A uh, bonus. But, you know, long term, uh, I, I think like Montembeau, you have to you have to give them the opportunity to run with a few games and, and see how they handle themselves. And when they get down, see how well they respond in getting back up and fighting, you know, uh, adversity. And really uh, a really tough uh, position. But... You're going to have to uh, get a, a read on them, I think, pretty soon so that they can, you know, make a decision and uh, decide what they want to do with their uh, their goaltenders. But Canadians sent Primo back to Laval after the game in Philly, whether that's just a paper move for salary cap reasons or whatnot, or if they'll call him back up again uh, uh, to play during this four-game homestand uh, at home. But one what, what of the interesting things Marty St. Louis said recently when he was asked about Montembeau, if Montembeau showed him something or proven something, and he said, we know what we have. They know what they have in Montembeau now. They've seen enough of him that they know who he is. They know what he is. So if he doesn't play much the rest of this season, it's because they already know what – they believe they already know what they have in him and where they can slot him in. Um, so that's a, a vote of confidence for Sam Montembeau. And uh, it'll be interesting to see, like, how many games Primo plays. It's a good question. Um, as I said, whether this was just a one-shot deal, whether another team in the NHL maybe has some interest in him and wanted to see him. And maybe that was just a one-game showcase or whether it's a case of the Kings are going to try and play him some more games moving forward. Uh, but as I said, after the game, they sent him back to Laval, but that doesn't mean they won't call him up again uh, before the next game. Well, as for the Montreal Canadiens, their size. That could be a factor when you think about guys like Gallagher, Cole Caulfield, Raphael Harvey Pernard, Lane Hudson, who's going to eventually be with the big club at some point uh, down the road. And, of course, with Sean Farrell and the team. They're all under six foot, guys. Is that a concern with the size of this team here, how they might have more speed to work with, but they might lack the height out of Stu Cameron and Mo Kahn when it comes to being six foot three plus in the world that we are in? Well, well I, I, don't, uh, I don't think so. I mean, if you look at the talent, speed, intelligence of these, these kids, and of course the way the game is today, I mean, you, if you put your stick on a guy's hands, it's, it's a penalty. So these guys... The smaller guys, unlike years ago, have an opportunity for success because they go, you know, uh, without too much, uh, uh, you know, obstruction. And, you know, it allows those skilled guys like they have uh, with uh, with Pennard and, and Hudson, uh, you know, remains to be seen. Farrell, uh, these are all good, smart players that uh, know how to play the game. So I, I don't see it as a big issue. It's not like you're asking these guys to go in and out muscle somebody in the corner to get the puck. They're going to be complimented with uh, other guys, uh, you know, that they're going to play with. That's going to, uh, it's, it's going to be an exper experimental time and see how, uh, how it works out. But at least they have the tools. And I believe, and the management obviously believes to sign them to contracts that 
they're they're going to be able to contribute uh, down the road, uh, no matter what their size is. But they do definitely have a uh, you know advantage with today's game that there's there's a no touching rule for for uh, for skilled guys, and you know it, it's going to work out for those kids that uh, that have skill and speed, and they're going to make it happen as we've seen. Uh, in Cole Caulfield and even Harvey Pennard is uh, he's, he's doing it, getting to the net without getting beat up too badly. Yeah, I think this question is a constant in Montreal, and like part of it is because they continue to find undersized, skilled forwards in the draft. Uh, you know, whether it's Brendan Gallagher or going back to like Saku Koivu, that maybe were drafted uh, lower than they should have been based on their skill levels, but. More than anything, I think the game has changed significantly over the last decade plus where there is an advantage for smaller players, but it's all about balance, right? And if you look at what the roster is building towards going forward, yeah, there are some small guys, but there's also Josh Anderson, there's Kirby Doc, there's Uri Slavkovsky. If you listen to all the NHL insiders next year, there is probably going to be Pierre-Luc Dubois. And then you look at the big towering guys they have on defense, it, even the young guys, like Justin Barron is not small. Caden Gooley is a big guy. Arbor Jack guy is a big guy. Even Jonathan Kovacevic, who's like a third pairing guy, he's a big dude. He can play physical as well. So it's not like they're a team full of only small players. They're a balanced team that can play with speed and physicality. And I think when you look at some of these players, like Gallagher, the last few games has looked better than he has in two and a half years, right? That's a strong sign. Who knows if he's actually going to be back anywhere close to what we expect uh, based on his contract. But if he can play like he's played the last three games, not even with the goal scoring, just the hunger and the happiness that he's playing with, he plays big, right? It's not necessarily just about physical size. It's about willing to sacrifice when you're on the ice and playing big person hockey. And the guys who aren't playing necessarily big guy hockey are – Guys like Cole Caulfield, Lane Hudson, who are so escapable, like they're so shifty with and without the puck, they're probably not going to take very many hits. So I, I think the Canadians are in a pretty good position here. I wouldn't worry much about the size. I think it can be a concern. I was talking with a former NHL player before a recent game at the Bell Center, and he says, you know, when I watch the Canadians, the first thing that comes to my mind is, man, are they small? And um, I know, Rick, you mentioned, you know, the no-touching rules in a place now, but when the playoffs start, it's – back to clutch and grab and referees put the whistles away and it becomes a physical game. So, you know, when Josh Anderson, when people are saying that, you know, well, they have to trade Josh Anderson, get rid of him. He's overpaid. He's this. And I was like, hold on a second. You need, you still need some size. You need some power forwards in your lineup, especially when you have so many young guys to sort of compliment them. Um, you know, they have Gurianov now is another big body that they've picked up. Slavkovsky's a big body and he's back next season. Pizzetta, if he's back next season on the fourth line, is a big body. So they have some big wingers that they can spread through the lineup to play with some of these smaller guys. As you mentioned, you got Doc at center, and Nick Suzuki's not big, but he's a strong guy. Um, so it's a little bit of a concern, but I think, uh, you know, I asked Josh Anderson, I said, uh, why should the Canadians not trade you? What would you say? And he said, there's not a lot of power forwards that came around, and you need those guys, especially in the playoffs. And once the Canadians get to the point where they're back, Hope, you know, for their say, hopefully back to being a regular playoff team. Uh, you'd have some big bodies, but they do have some uh, to complement the smaller guys. But um, you know, once you get to the playoffs, it's still big boy hockey. It's uh, you know the NHL rule book is, changes from period to period, from game to game, and especially during the playoffs, it's uh, rock 'em sock 'em hockey again. And uh, you know, maybe and maybe in the playoffs, it's a zero game suspension for cross checking guy in the face instead of a one game suspension. Who knows? <laughs> Well, I think one thing to keep in mind at the playoffs as well is you look at who actually leads the scoring races in the playoffs. And yeah, it is big boy hockey in the playoffs, but Nikita Kucherov is 5'11". He's got the most playoff points in the last decade. Braden Point is like, what, 5'9", generously. You know, some of the best playoff players of the last generation, Danny Breer, generously listed at 5'9". Uh Sidney Crosby is only 5'11". I know he's Sidney Crosby. Brad Marchand, 5'9". Andre Palat's only 6 foot. There's only a handful of guys over 6 foot in the top like 25 in scoring in the playoffs over the last 20, uh, 10 years. So those young, like littler players do have advantages. Even when hockey gets more physical, that low center of gravity, 
does contribute and guys like Rafael Harvey Pinard who are willing to sacrifice their body in front of the net or block a shot off their skate and still stay out there on a penalty kill and maybe not be so useful, but end up scoring later in the game because they're willing to put their body on the line. I don't worry about those kinds of players uh, in terms of size. But those it smaller just... players you mentioned, Andrew, are also surrounded by bigger guys too. That's what allows them to... to well, to, to, who's the bigger guy for Brad Marchand on his line? I'm sorry? Who's well, the bigger, bigger guy guys for Brad on the team. It's, it's not. I mean, you look at the Canadians back when they, you know, that surprising run to the Stanley Cup final in 2021. I mean, Carey Price was the main reason they got there. The second main reason is those four huge defensemen they had. You know, the four Clydesdales who just made life miserable for opposing forwards in the offensive zone. So it's not necessarily on the line. It's like having other big guys on the team um, who just make it physical on the other teams to play. It makes it physical for them to play against and maybe wears down their defense a little bit, makes it easier for some of the smaller guys when they get on the ice. But, I mean, yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, the game has changed to the point. I mean, a guy like Raphael Harvey Pernard never would have got a look in the NHL back when Rick was playing. I mean, uh, you know, Cole Caulfield never would have got drafted. I mean, you know, Marty St. Louis never got drafted because he was small. So the game has changed in, in that respect, but I still think you need to have size in your lineup, especially when it gets to the playoffs. Like, and even Ken Hughes has said that, like, you can't have a, a full line of, of guys who are like five foot seven, or, and you can't have, you know, 12 guys on the team who are under six foot tall. I just don't think you're going to win in today's NHL, but young guys can, we've seen him in Cole Caulfield can score goals at the NHL, but I still, I think you need to have size spread out throughout the lineup. Well, that, they do have that. Yeah, they though. do. That's yeah, yeah. Rick, final word. I uh, just going to say the combination of uh, you know who you're playing with uh, makes a big difference. But one thing I think will never change, no matter how how big or how small you are. I think they're trying to bring in guys with heart and desire and character uh, that's going to you know blend right in with their whole team concept. And uh, like I said, you can be five foot six and. Uh, have a heart like a lion and, you know, uh, be very, very effective in today's game. That's why I've just maintained all along that just, you know, I wouldn't trade Josh Anderson. I wouldn't be in a rush to trade Josh Anderson, depending on what you're getting back in return for him, especially with the way this team is built. Well, for Josh Anderson, he was once described as a power horse. For Ken Hughes, they've, they've invested in the thoroughbreds right now. So you wonder maybe in the off season they might look at that and bring some more size to work with. As Sue said, and as Andrew said, as Rick said, kind of insulate those speedsters that they have on the team moving forward. We'll find out. But right now, they're a little bit short in height, but they have plenty of heart and determination. And we'll see how this young core develops moving towards the future years of the Montreal Canadiens. Well, on to the last question for the week, guys. As the Canadiens end their season with no playoffs in sight, what should have fans look forward to for the future of this franchise, guys? Well, I think there's a multitude of factors that should keep Canadians fans positive. Uh, number one is they're going to have a high pick, right? They're probably going to finish about fifth last in the NHL. You can get lucky, move up a little bit. You never know. Or you can get unlucky and move down two spots. But either way, that's a decent pick in that range. There's going to be good players available. The other thing is improvement year over year. People forget last year the Canadians only had 55 points. They already have 66. They're on pace for 72 that's actually a very large improvement year over year, a pretty rare improvement in the NHL. It's almost impossible to improve by 20 points year over year. Uh, it's it's very, very difficult. I think maybe the Boston Bruins have done that this year based on their perfect season, essentially, but it is very rare for that to happen. So the Canadians are on the right track. And the biggest one for me is all those rookies on defense. Canadians have five rookies that have played big minutes this year on defense. And I expect each and every one of those guys to be a little bit less green and a little bit more vet savvy next year. And that's going to take a huge load off of the goaltending off of the coaching staff. I think maybe some stress off the coaching staff and it's going to pay dividends big time. I think defense is the area where I think reps are most important in understanding the nuances of the defensive game and we're going to see in my opinion the biggest growth from those five guys and how they run things on the defensive side Caden Gooley is the one I think is going to be the biggest jump from this year to next year because while you look at him and you if you isolate his individual plays you say this is a guy who's playing great hockey his numbers not so great. Uh, maybe in over his head a little bit in the first half of the season when Mike Matheson was barely able to play. 
uh, playing top line minutes. But uh, as things, you know, get normalized for him as an NHL player, we're going to see that individual performance translate into on ice performance in a way that will help the Montreal Canadiens in a big way. Well, as you talked about that jump in the standings or the you know, points improvement, possibly as much as 20 points. That's also with 10 or 11 guys injured for most of his game, yep. which makes it even more remarkable that the, this improvement. I mean, you think they should have gone backwards just because of all the injuries they've had, and instead they've moved forwards. And to me, the biggest reason Canadians fans should have hope for the future is Marty St. Louis. Uh, the way this team has competes, it doesn't matter who's in the lineup. Uh, some nights they don't have enough talent to win, and they still can still win games. They compete every night. It's very rare they get blown out. Even when they get blown out, they don't give up. There's games they're down four goals in the third period. They're still trying. They're still battling. They're still fighting, literally sometimes. But um, I think Marty St. Louis is the biggest reason. He's you know 95% of coaching in the NHL today is just getting guys to believe and buy into what you're selling. And this brand of hockey that Marty St. Louis wants to play, the guys have bought into it from the first liners down to the fourth liners. They're enjoying playing for them. They're having fun playing for them. And speaking with the guys in the locker room, they're getting calls or talking with buddies they have on teams around the league. When they're on the road, they're up for dinner with former teammates. And the question they're all getting is, what's with Marty St. Louis? Is this the real deal? Like, what's going on with this guy? So the word's getting around the league. And moving forward, that might make Montreal a more attractive market possibly for free agents too, offensive style players. Look what he's done with Kirby Doc. Yeah, you look at the different player Cole Caulfield was from you know when Dominic Ducharme was fired and Marty St. Louis took over. He became like a, a, another player. He became the player that he was before. Um, so I think Marty St. Louis is the biggest reason, just that players want to play for him. They want to work hard for him. He's got great communication skills. He's good dealing with players. Uh, you know, Michael Pizzetta, uh, one of the biggest ones. I mean, he was telling me, you know, Previously, last season when he got called up when Ducharme was coaching, he was basically told, get the puck over the red line and just dump it in and chase it. That's all they wanted him to do. Don't try and do anything else. Now Marty St. Louis is giving him options. And the brand that he wants to play, it's the like, it, same with the first liners and the fourth liners. Like He wants them all sort of playing the same style of game. And uh, guys like guys are buying into that. Guys are enjoying it, and they're having a lot of fun doing it. And you know the fact that Marty picked Pozzetta to go in the shootout there the other night and he scored the winning goal – that, that lights a spark under the team. That makes everybody feel good. So it's it's. I think Marty St. Louis is the biggest reason uh, for optimism moving forward. Plus, as you mentioned, Andrew, all the young players who got a lot of experience this year that they probably wouldn't have without all the injuries, both defense and forwards, like a Raphael Harvey Pinard. He probably wouldn't even played in Montreal if it wasn't for the injuries. He got up here, made the most of his opportunity, and it's hard to believe he won't be with the team next year. Yeah, and I mean, let's face it. I'm, I'm sure they're hoping that this terrible injury plague season is behind them. They won't have to deal with that again as, you know, they, they really, really struggle to keep everybody in the lineup and take those guys that were hurt for long periods of time. They weren't missing like, you know, a week or uh, two weeks. They were long-term injuries. So they really didn't have the opportunity to play as a full group and, you know, allow them to develop as a group. And, uh, you know, that, that being said, they still responded pretty well, but I'd like to see these guys when they get everybody back, uh, everybody filled in where they were penciled in before, feeling healthy and, you know, continuing on their ways of showing up each and every night and following the system and playing hard. And the bottom line out of all of this is uh, when you have that group, I, I like to see what they're going to be able to do you know over the course of the season but one thing that remains constant is they're going to show up each and every night and they're going to work and the fans are going to be entertained because they are working and they care so the chemistry and the importance of everybody towing the line uh, and grabbing hold and trying to make the difference each and every night is a huge bonus and that's a compliment to the whole organization and bringing in the type of people so now if we can keep them uh you know, on the uh, healthy side, let's see them develop uh, with time. All the young kids that they do have are pro progressing very nicely and they're going to continue to progress and uh, be a big part and a really nice team to watch and be entertained. And the fans will really appreciate that as we've seen in the in the past. The other thing the injury didn't, didn't allow is to have regular sort of line mates or defense pairings either. I mean, so many guys in and out of the lineup. I mean, Nick Suzuki's played with like everybody, I think. And, you know, the defense pairings have been mixed up. They haven't had a, a 
a lot of time for chemistry to develop between line mates just because so many guys have been in and out of the lineup. So that's one thing I think Marty St. Louis, these last few games with Gallagher back, you know, we've seen him playing with Jake Evans. Is that something moving forward? We might see those guys together more often, in a similar style, who they put with that line. So, um, yeah, but just an impressive, you know, the Canes are going to finish 28th or whatever in the overall standings, but uh, a, a, so much of an improvement from last season, not just in points in the standings, but just they're fun to watch now. It's a fun team to watch. Uh, and, and the guys that compete every time they're on the ice. So that's that's a, a big, big step moving forward in this rebuild. So I'm going to reverse the question, you guys. Is there anything to be concerned if you're a Habs fan moving forward with this team? I guess it depends what your expectations are, right? If you expect them to make the playoffs next year, uh, I think the performance of the goaltenders overall, maybe be concerned whether that's repeatable. Like, Is this who Sam Montembeau is? Can he do this again where he's a top 10 goaltender in terms of goals saved above expected in the league? Can he do that on the team that's good? Like if anybody's read the game by Ken Dryden, he talks about there being good good team goaltenders and good bad team goaltenders. Is Sam Montebo just a good bad team goaltender where he needs that like overwhelming number of scoring chances against to build up his, his uh, save percentage essentially to look better? Or is he a guy who can lock it down when you're holding the lead in the third period against another contending team? Maybe some question marks around there. And, you know, there's always question marks about uh, when they're going forward into like competitive windows. Do they have the elite talent to get them over the hump instead of just a bunch of really good players? Because when you look at who actually wins the playoffs, it's pretty rare that the, the Boston's and the St. Louis blues teams that have really good talent, but maybe not like the superstar center end up winning the Stanley cup. So there's like little niches, I guess that you can look at that you could be worried about, but overall, I think they're all right. I think it's going to be the patience. As you mentioned, Andrew, with the fans, um, you know, Ken Hughes did a, a podcast with Pierre Lebrun recently, and it was asked, you know, how, how far away do you think you are from being a regular team, competitive team in the playoffs? And he said, probably three years. And that's, Probably what it's going to be. Rebuilds take time. So the first the first full season of a rebuild has gone well, uh, despite all the injuries. But I think Canadians fans just need to be a little patient. You know, some people say, "Oh, maybe they're going to be in the playoffs next year." I mean, it's they get Connor Bedard that would certainly improve their chances of that happening. But um, you know, they they improve by they might improve by twenty points this season. Are they going to improve by another twenty points next season? Probably not, but um, they're on the right grounds, the right step here. And the fact they have a GM who's willing to say that publicly, that it's probably three years away, just is, is being you know very open and honest about it. It's going to take time. It's going to take time to build this, but they're, they're on. They've taken the first step to the, what's going to be three or four steps of seasons before they get to where they want to be. So I think people just need to be patient and appreciate the fact that they're, they're on the right path now. And after so many years of... Mark Bergeron never really having a plan for the future, just sort of plugging holes here and there and hope the best they have a concrete plan now and we'll see if it works moving forward. And, and no surprise to you guys, uh, you know, I'd love to see them shore up their defensive zone play by just trying to uh, to eliminate some of the real good primetime scoring chances that they're giving up that is it's a little bit too much run and gun and, and try and eliminate those guys doing the front crawl on two-on-ones uh, with the defenseman. Uh, you know, swimming away at that. And that's, to me, it's just something that uh, is part of the whole defensive zone play. And uh, I, I think that that's, that's an, an area that they need to, uh, to to strengthen and, you know, stabilize in order for them to have some success because you can't go and play the, those type of games. I, I don't care if you look at the number of games uh, that they played and the number of chances that have been given up through breakdown defensively, um, you can get get away with it once in a while, but over the whole the whole season, it's going to come back and haunt you. So fix that up, and the rest of the game uh, will take care of itself. Interesting, you said too, Andrew, about you know a good goalie on a bad team type of thing. There's also when you're on a bad team, there's not a lot of pressure, right? I mean, you're true the difference. You're not you know you're not you're not going in net saying we need to win this or we're out of the playoffs. It's a different level of pressure. And Ken Hughes addressed that also when he spoke at his mid-season news conference, he said, you know, three years from now, the pressure level is going to be higher on everybody in the organization from the GM to the coaching staff, to the players, to the goalies. And as he said, different people react differently under pressure and we'll see what happens moving forward. So that's another thing is, is there's no pressure on this team right now. And once there is pressure to win and get into the playoffs, it's a whole different ballgame. 
Yeah, one other thing I'd like to see them improve is the special teams. Yes. That's yeah. my God. That's, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> they got to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's one thing we'll look forward to for this Montreal franchise. I mean, look, many fans did not predict them to make the playoffs. They got this far, game 75, before they officially bounced out from the playoff race. But optimism is brewing for this franchise moving forward. And we'll see what they do in the offseason going towards training camp in September. And we'll see how that plays out. Don't forget to submit your questions and comments here at Hockey Inside Out. We look forward to conversing about that in a future episode. And check out on the YouTube page for Hockey Inside Out. And sign up for the newsletter at MontrealGazette.com slash newsletters. And for full episodes and bonus content, head on by Hockey Inside Out. On behalf of Stu, Andrew, and Rick, wish you a great week. We'll speak to you soon. Bye for now. Hey.